Hello and welcome to today's live stream. We're so excited to have you. In less than five minutes, we're going to be talking to a close friend of mine, Jordan Bunch, about filmmaker issues or mistakes that filmmakers make when they're first getting started. So while we're waiting, if you could just do me a favor and put in the comments below where you're joining us from. Looks like we already have about 10 people joining us. Hello and welcome. If you could do me a favor, let me know where you're joining from. Also, bonus points if you start a watch party. Thanks. just joining us welcome to the live stream get your questions ready at the end of today's presentation we're going to have a little q a as well and if you do have any questions we want to make sure that we are getting those kind of in the queue so that way we can put them up on screen so at any time if you do have a question you can ask it during the presentation but we'll put it up there at the end so that way we can get it answered we'll talk soon It is time to get this party started. So you can tell we are in store. Uh, we are now opening up a little bit more as far as our hours are concerned. Uh, so we will be rocking masks. You can see my awesome llama masks that we have going on here in store. Uh, but we are open for curbside pickup from back to our normal store hours of 10 to 7. So that, that puts a smile on my face because it's hopes it's, I'm hopeful that we're getting closer to 
a state of normalcy. What is normal? Who knows? But that's where we're moving towards. So today, I am I'm excited for this presentation because I bet everything that Jordan's going to cover today is all mistakes that I have made or I'm currently making. So it's really cool that we have Jordan on here and he's able to share his knowledge with us. So let's go ahead and get him added to the live stream here. So that way we can see kind of how he is doing. How are we doing, my friend? I'm doing pretty good today. I'm excited to be here uh, and to welcome all of you into my studio here in Austin, Texas. Absolutely. So let's see who we have joining us so far. We have Bill Perry hey, Bill. joining us from Austin, Texas. How are we doing? We have Jim Summers who says it is cloudy with a chance of being illuminated. I like your plan <laughs> words there in Wadsworth, Ohio. We have Linda Ford joining us from North Olmsted. Hello, Linda. Hope you are doing well. And our friendly uh, Lumix account manager, Brad Cohn from Mentor Ohio. So it looks like we have about 15 people, uh, 20 people. I've just jumped up to 20 because now it's past the time. So thank you guys so much for joining. I appreciate it. So Jordan, tell us a little bit about you. So what do you do? I see Film Mavericks up there. You said we're in your studio in Austin, Texas. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, um, I have been a filmmaker for uh, the last last 10 years or so, at least, uh, you know, professionally for the last 10 years or so. Um, I really started out in weddings and actually started in photography uh, professionally before before filmmaking. So, you know, I imagine like a lot of people who are understanding that they get more into video or, or wanting to kind of scratch that itch or, you know, budding filmmakers who are getting into this for the first time. Um, you know, that was me and it doesn't feel like it was that long ago. It's, it's weird to say 10 years ago. Uh, but yeah, I'm here. Uh, this is my studio. So I own two companies. Uh, Film Mavericks is one and the other is Ladybird Studios. And uh, we have about a dozen people on staff. Uh, right now, I'm the only one here with all this stuff going on and everything. But uh, we've got a wall over here that you could see if you were here with me with that's just full uh, floor to ceiling, 20 foot ceiling over there uh, full of wedding photos. Uh, so we do a lot of weddings and corporate events, but also uh, documentary filmmaking and commercial filmmaking. So we kind of scratch all three of those those itches with the two companies. Uh, I'm also a, a, a Lumix Global Ambassador. So I've been shooting with since 2015 or 16. Excellent. So you said um, there, I've seen pictures of your studio. So where can people find you online too, if they want to kind of do some research? Where's the best place to find yeah. you? Uh, the Film Mavericks group is a really active group on Facebook of filmmakers. Um, and there's about, you know, 4,000, 4,500 people in that group. That's a great way to connect with me for sure. Also, uh, the Film Mavericks YouTube channel is a great place, but also just, you know, uh, I guess connect with me. Probably that is actually the best way I would say friend request me, but uh, I'm not the greatest one about making sure I accept all those. So, <laughs> yeah, um, so the definitely I'll connect with you if you message me on that group. People. So 4,500 people in a group that you can learn from, I would say that's probably one of the best places to check out. So we did get a couple of people join us from he, uh, from in the chat. Hello, Glenna from Cleveland Heights. Hope you're doing well. Jen Jones, Denver says, hey, hello, Jen. Hope you're doing well. And Karna from Rainy Canton, Michigan. So hello, Karna. So before we get started with our presentation today, I did have just a few housekeeping items. So uh, we are open at the store for curbside pickup. So if you do need absolutely anything, please do not hesitate. Let us know. We're here answering the phones. We're on live chat. We're doing is everything that we can to help the creators that you know, we serve. So if you need absolutely anything, let us know. Um, our store hours are back to our normal, uh, which is 10 to seven. There's a little typo there, but it's 10 to seven. Um, so if you need anything, please let us know. We also offer free shipping on thousands of items. So if you need something shipped to your door, we can do that as well. 
Our goal is to do this every day at noon. So if you do have a presentation that you want to see or a topic that you want covered, please let us know. Just shoot me a message and say, hey, I want to learn a little bit more about you know filmmaking or starting the filmmaking business. And we will find someone. Maybe we'll have Jordan back on in order to do that. But I want to hear from you guys. I want to make sure that the content that we're putting out there is meeting your needs. Also, a quick note about the PPA. So if you want to learn a little bit more, if you're thirsty to learn more about photo, video, business, those kind of things, then definitely check out the PPA website. If you go over to ppa.com slash in it together, you'll actually be able to get access to all of their content that is normally behind a 30 to $40 paywall. And that is opened up for free until the end of May. And you know they don't sponsor any of this. Or they're not asking us. It's really just an awesome resource that I want to share with you guys. And that's why I share it at the top of every live stream. Also, if you could do me a huge favor, if you go to social.thepixelconnection.com, you'll see an option for podcasts. And that's a podcast that we launched last week in which myself and another local photographer, Justin, talk all about the business of photography. So with that, if you are thinking about starting you know, a business in photography or you, know, you just want tips on you know, how to run a photography business, then that podcast is definitely for you. So if you could do us that, that huge favor and you can go over and like that we would absolutely love that and we would thank you so much for it so what are our goals for today number one would be to pull you away from the fear uncertainty and the doubt the FUD if you will and there's a lot going on in the you know in the news there's a lot going on around us and changes every single day my goal is just to remind you that you have this love and passion for photography and videography that has the ability to pull you away from all that you know the kind of the bad news the fear the uncertainty and doubt and even if it's only for this one hour at the end of the day that is my number one goal also i want to get you tr motivated to try something new something that's outside of your comfort zone that is where the magic happens. That's where you know we truly see personal group growth is when we get outside of that zone. So again, that is my goal today as well, to get you into or out of your comfort zone. And finally, help you discover a new niche. So let's say that you know, you've never thought about adding video to your portfolio because you're just scared of it. My goal is to hopefully provide speakers like Jordan in which he can share information and get you into something that's more profitable. Maybe that's real estate, you know, videos, maybe that's, you know, starting a YouTube channel, whatever that might be. I would love to be the one that can help you achieve that goal. If you need absolutely anything from us, you can reach out. Uh, the resources can, you know, if we do have any resources or if we mention anything during the show, uh, you could just email me and I'll get back to you at social at the pixel connection. Dot com. So that is enough from me. Let's talk to Mr. Jordan about five mistakes. I think it's five. Is it five? Is it? It's multiple mistakes. That a five. Film yeah. It is five. Yeah, five mistakes. So five mistakes that beginner filmmakers make. Awesome. Yeah. Well, we'll dive right into it then. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, a few key objectives here. We'll go over the five things and. Uh, some people would say I cheated here and did six when I really did uh, five. But uh, the first one, nailing our white balance and exposure. Um, this is something that is so critical, and it's something that uh, most filmmakers think that they're doing right, but they're really doing wrong. Um, bad audio is a big one. Uh, this is, you know, you can't you can't watch something with bad audio. Uh, shaky video is another another thing. So we're going to talk about how to resolve that. We're gonna talk about frame rates because as a photographer, this is something that you're probably not familiar with because it's not part of the equation for you. Um, so we'll talk about that. And we'll also talk about slow motion because it's, it's done. Um, so we wanna, wanna cover these five things and help you fix these because if you fix these things, um, you're immediately skyrocketed um, above so much of, of the competition. So that's what we're gonna go over today. Um, so first, we're going to talk about the white balance and exposure. Um, the, the biggest difference here with filmmaking versus photography is that with photography, you know, you're typically working with much more robust files. You're working with raw files with 16-bit. And uh, you know, we, don't have, we don't have the capability to do that uh, with most of our cameras for video. Now, uh, you know, some cameras, like, in fact, in about a month, the, uh, the Lumix S1H, 
um, is partnering with Atomos, and they're going to give us raw video, which is going to be amazing to be able to have that as an option. Um, but for the vast majority of us, if we're using the cameras that we have for photography, it's more important to nail our exposure properly because we're not going to be able to recover highlight and shadow detail like we can with a raw photo. Um, so this is just so important. Um, you know, you've, you've done it so often, right, where you take a raw photo and the sky is just kind of blown out. And the amazing thing is that with raw photos, you can just drag that highlight slider down and you save the sky. Well, you can't do that with video. Um, so it's much more important that we have a very accurate exposure. And we're going to talk a little bit more about how we can do that uh, with filmmaking. Some of the tools that we have access to with most of your cameras that will enable you to do that. Um, and also the colors are way more baked in. You know, this is, it's much more akin to shooting a um, sort of a, a version of, of JPEG image from 10 years ago. Uh, that's kind of what you have access to in terms of flexibility of the image uh, with video. So, uh, so you know, one of the reasons why you filmmakers a lot more kind of gear hungry uh, than some photographers is because the advancements that are being made in the video space are just like going at leaps and bounds. Whereas with photography, it's kind of these small tweaks, right? It's like uh, a little bit better ISO performance, a little bit higher resolution, some of these kind of things. But with video, we're oftentimes from one generation camera to the next, um, like, you know, with this S1H, we're just making these huge leaps forward um, and, and really able to have a lot more flexibility with things. Uh, which is game changing for us. But if we get these things done right in camera, um, it really is gonna help us out a ton. I'm gonna show you a quick video that we did. This is like a two minute video. It was a context for this. This is a uh, wedding and event filmmaking, uh, sorry, <laughs> a wedding and event uh, band. So they do live events and weddings. that just kind of showed what they did. So this is a situation where it's an extremely high dynamic range situation. So pay attention to, um, to how we captured exposures, pay attention to highlight and shadow detail. We'll come back and talk a little bit more about it in general, but I wanted to show you an example uh, as we get started here. So here we go. Uh, so you can see uh, this is a really extreme kind of high dynamic situation. In this case, we are uh, shooting a, a backlit sunset. Uh, we've got the front reflecting these buildings. See how we're really saving the highlight detail and even getting extracting color out of these extreme harsh uh, edges around here. I don't know if, what, what version of the thing we're on, but we can see like here in this reflection, uh, of the building, you can see there's still so much color left in there um, all along the edge detail, but we're still holding on to the shadow detail um, in this uh, lead singer's face and on through his black shirt. So this is this is kind of one of those most extreme situations where you're dealing with uh, you know the brightest brights and the darkest darks. 
And, you know, that's where having a feature, you know, the, the camera like the S1H that can shoot 15 stops of dynamic range that has access to shooting, uh, you know, in V-log, um, which, you know, uh, you may or may not know what that is if you're kind of new to this, but basically that's just kind of a flatter version that gives us a little bit more flexibility with these things. Um, but that's an amazing tool, but you really had to do is we did have to crush some of these blacks. So the black along like his hat, even underneath his, his beard and in his shirt, there's a little bit of a loss of detail in some of those areas. And we're willing to sacrifice that to have the highlight detail. Um, it's so important. If you watch, you know, watch any show on Netflix, uh, you know, the vast majority of films, you're never going to see highlights blown. Um, you'll often see blacks completely crushed because they uh, they took more care into saving the highlights. And so um, that's what I'm going to encourage you to do is to take the most care in saving the highlights. And if you can save both, obviously that's ideal, but we can't always do that. So, um, we, so can, we are going to say if we can jump through whenever you show the video that was a little skippy. Okay. So I'll share the video out on our social though. Any videos that you show, we'll put out on our social. This is not the best way to show video, but it's a video class, so we got to do what we got to do. Um, okay, so I'm going to talk about a few things. Obviously, like I said, we're exposing for the highlights. What that means is that we're really paying attention to any of the brightest areas of the, of, uh, of the image, and we're going to make sure that we have detail in those areas. So we have a couple of tools. There's, there's uh, you know, really kind of three tools that we use uh, for this. One is uh, waveforms. And my, this is my personal favorite. I love waveforms. Um, and TJ, if you'll show, I don't know if you're on the full screen of me, but show, show me here for a second. I want to point to something on the screen. Hopefully, y'all can see this well. Um, but we're going from 0 to 100 here. And this is kind of the scale for a waveform. And so the way that we read this is this is this is a better version than, than histograms because this actually shows us sort of a, a, a version of what the image actually looks like. Right side of what the right side of the frame looks like. This is what the left side of the frame looks like. Whereas with a histogram, it's just kind of all clumped together. So we're able to see, okay, well, this area over here, maybe there was a window that we're shooting at towards here and here. Um, and so those are the brightest areas of the frame. So I can see that, but I can see that, oh, I didn't go to 100. So I still have some highlight detail there. Um, and this is kind of the perfectly exposed image, right? Because I still have a little bit of my shadow detail. It didn't go below that 100 line um, or didn't hit the zero line, I mean. Uh, and so we know that this is uh, an appropriately uh, exposed image. Now, if we had to, because there was a greater dynamic range in our image than this, and we didn't have any extra lights to fill it in, I would push this further down in order to save these highlights, even if it sacrificed things being, uh, you know, detail being lost in the blacks. Um, so that's kind of how we use the waveforms. Uh, I don't know, you know, which all... Lumix has feature. Uh, if it doesn't, if your camera doesn't have waveforms, it might have a histogram. It should definitely have a histogram. Um, but uh, you should know how to read this, hopefully. But basically, we're just talking about highlights over here, shadows over here, and this is kind of everything else in the middle. So if this stuff, if all this gray area moves over here um, and gets right to the edge, then we know we've lost our highlight detail and the same thing over here with our shadows. So we can see here we lost a little bit of shadow detail in some parts of the image. We don't know which parts of the image with the histogram like we do with the waveform, but we know we lost some shadow detail. Uh, the third tool is a tool called Zebras, and uh, this is an amazing tool that will actually show you on the actual uh, image itself. It'll put these little zebra stripes, so you can see, oh, these clouds over here are overexposed, and I can turn that down. Um, so that's another really amazing tool that will help you expose for, um, for your highlights. You really just what you see in terms of the actual image on the back of the screen, you've got to use some of these tools in order to expose your image properly, especially when you're shooting outside because the sunlight's so bright and the screens, uh, sometimes they aren't as bright as they need to be in order to get a, a good measurement of what that actually looks like. And so that's why it's so important to use these tools when you're getting your exposure right. 
Okay, um, this is not gonna, I'm not gonna do like the full exposure triangle thing, that's another class, right? But ISO, that's the same as photography. You don't have to think anything different about that. The aperture is a little bit different with video in terms of how you need to think about it. Um, I put iris here, if you're using a cinema lens, it uses the term iris, but it's the same thing as aperture. Um, you just need to be aware that you may need to stop down a little bit more for uh, video than you do need to with photo. And the reason is when you're taking a still photo, you're capturing this one quick moment in time. And we're good to go, right? But with video, uh, you might be moving if you're doing it handheld, but if you're locked down on a tripod like I am here, your subject might be moving, might be moving around like this. Even if they're sitting in a chair, um, you know, they're gonna make these little movements. And if you're shooting with say a full frame sensor and you shoot that, you know, with a, a, a sort of a telephoto-ish lens or, or medium lens, a portrait lens like an 85, and you're shooting at 1.4, good luck keeping them in focus because they're gonna be moving around like this. So it's much better if we can kind of stop down a little bit in order to save a little bit more, um, expand uh, that depth of field so we can keep our subject nice and in focus. And we still have plenty of room to have nice creamy bokeh when we stop our, our aperture down like that. But I know a lot of people love to shoot photos wide open a lot, and you need to think about uh, you need to think about focus more whenever you're shooting video. That you probably need to stop down a little bit. Another thing uh, that's different for filmmaking uh, with your shutter speed or your shutter angle, if you're working with a cinema camera, is that you need to at least double your frame rate. So we're going to talk about frame rates later, um, but uh, if we're shooting. Uh, at a 24p frame rate, we need to at least double that. So we need to shoot, you know, for your, for most of your cameras, it's gonna be 1 50th of a second, close enough to double, right? So um, now a lot of filmmaking, uh, the education that's done around that will tell you, you need to shoot exactly double the frame rate. And uh, you know, that's fine. And a lot of people do that, but a lot of people don't. And in some situations it can be okay to go over that you know, to shoot at a higher frame, uh, at a higher shutter, a faster shutter than double your frame rate, but you don't ever wanna go below that. Going below that can give you some really weird issues. Um, so, an example later on in the section of what that looks like when you go below it. Um, but uh, the other thing is that uh, it adds, so with photography, a lot of times we're thinking about really trying to stop motion and with filmmaking, we want a little bit of that motion blur. Um, whenever we go faster, we notice that it's totally stopped, right? But with at 1 60th of a second, you can see a little bit of blur on that image of this little pinwheel here. And that's actually what we want because we're shooting, you know, oftentimes at like 24 frames a second, 30 frames a second. And having that little bit of, of a blur, of motion blur, actually makes a more appealing image. It looks a little bit more smooth and natural to the eye. And so that really is the ideal frame rate, uh, sorry, the ideal shutter speed for that frame rate. So uh, we do want that little bit of really help between things. So if we're shooting at 24 frames a second, and we're going from frame one to two, it helps kind of smooth out that transition um, in between each frame if we have a little bit of motion blur like that. Now, the way to keep that and to always get that and do that right is to use a variable ND filter. That's the easiest way to do it. Um, this is basically a little filter that goes in the front of your lens. Um, you know, Pixel Connection sells a lot of these, I'm sure. Um, but basically, you can just spin the front of the filter and the image is gonna get darker or lighter. Um, and so it's a really great tool to be able to basically close down the amount of light that's coming through the lens so that you can keep your shutter where you would need to. Because if you're just shooting photography and you're going outside and it's a bright sunny day, you know, you might have your shutter at one eight thousandth of a second or even higher. Um, but when you do that with video, we start to get some weird effects, particularly when we shoot things like water fountains uh, where there's droplets of water, things like that you don't notice it quite as much when you're just shooting people. So in some situations, you can kind of get away with it and nobody would notice. But in others, it's really obvious. Uh, this is particularly the case with like drone footage and that kind of thing. So it 
ND filters are really important for, for drone footage as well, you see so much more of this choppiness and I see a ton of, of choppiness. I didn't say this, but I actually gathered my, my five points here from uh, the last four years of judging international film competitions for commercial and wedding films, um, mostly at WPPI uh, in Las Vegas. So, you know, I've judged hundreds of films from filmmakers all around the world. And these are, these are all issues that I've seen in there. Um, so often I see this issue um, and it just is incredibly distracting to a film. Um, which Tarantino. But Tarantino is allowed to break the rules because yeah, he's Tarantino. Okay, the other uh, thing is with white balance. And this is again, I, I find that a lot of photographers just use auto white balance and uh, usually that's okay. Um, and it works pretty well in most situations, especially because you can shoot in raw and kind of fix it later. The problem is you can't really use auto white balance with video because if I, you know, do a pan from here to here, my white balance might change. And if my white balance is changing as I'm shooting here and I turn here, well, when we go to edit that, it's going to look really bizarre. And there's really not a good way to fix that. You'd have to kind of go frame by frame and adjust each frame rather than adjusting the whole clip. So it just kind of turns into a big mess. It's not something you want to deal with. So you do have to learn how to shoot uh, with the Kelvin scale and manual white balance. Uh, so, you know, candlelight being closer to, you know, 3000 Kelvin um, or, you know, oftentimes even lower, like 2500 Kelvin and moonlight being, you know, eight, 9000 Kelvin um, and normal daylight being about 5,600 Kelvin. Uh, and so it's really helpful to kind of know these things. And one of the one of the tricks I do with my team is I challenge them to just kind of play a game when you're going to places. You know, when you walk into a room, guess what the white balance is? You know, a lot of times we're in mixed lighting environments because they might have tungsten bulbs, but there's a lot of window light coming in. And um, so uh, there's all kinds of variety there, but this is a huge deal for filmmaking because there's so much less flexibility with your color. And if you don't get your white balance right, it becomes really difficult to get the look that you're trying to achieve because you're doing so much color correction. And then you're trying to apply like an alut or something. And it just becomes a mess if you don't get your white balance right in camera. So the kind of trick that I use for this is I look for something that's white in the frame uh, and I try to make it white. You know, I know a lot of people like to use like 18% gray cards and things like that. Uh, and most of the stuff that we do, we just don't have time to mess with that. And so we've gotten really good at just looking for something that should be white, a white shirt, a piece of paper, a sign, whatever, something that is supposed to be white and make it look white in our image. I mean, if we do that, skin tones really fall. I'm gonna show you an example of that here. And this is at a wedding. Um, and uh, I'll show you something else about what we do with this. This is a way that we achieve good looking skin tones, but still keep a romantic tone in terms of our white balance with the image. So we're shooting this with a light that's balanced to 5,600 Kelvin, um, a key light that's hitting our subject here. And we're on camera 600 Kelvin to our key light, to match our key light. And so that lets this warm romantic ambiance go on in the background here to let us feel kind of the warmth and the romance of this room that the bride and groom are dancing in, um, but still have their skin tones look really nice to not have that kind of orange fake tan look uh, that we see so often um, in, in films. And this is kind of one of those things that gets a lot of negative marks with you know, some of our, uh, in, the, in the film competitions that, that we judge, um, is that, you know, people's skin looks horrible because they didn't do their white balance properly. So here's another example of that. And this is kind of hitting them. You can see the warmth in the bride's dress back here. So in this case, I didn't care so much about her dress not being white like it should be because it adds to the warmness of the ambiance in this room. But our subject is uh, a balance probably wilder uh, and we we make their skin look good the subject skin look good while still giving the romance of what's happening in the room okay next we're going to talk a little bit about audio this this really could be like a whole nother class 
Um, and, and, you know, if, if you guys want that, let Pixel Connection know. I'd be happy to teach a whole other class on this because audio is a really tricky subject, um, but we only have a little bit of time to cover this today. Um, but it really is, it's half of getting your video um, to be a great video, is getting good sound. If, you know, there's been a lot of, uh, a lot of talk about people can have a higher tolerance of bad video than they do of bad audio. If you have bad audio, it's really hard to even watch something. Um, but if you have really good audio and not as good video, it's a lot easier to watch what's happening. So this really is a super important thing, and it's something that most whatever they kind of think about it later. But this is so important um, for for most people, most filmmaking. There's really kind of two mics that you want to be thinking about. One is a lav mic, like what I'm wearing here, um, and this is kind of the easiest solution. Um, and then the other one is boom mic, and boom mics in a lot of situations are the better choice, uh, but it's it's uh, oftentimes more expensive. Sometimes it takes an operator to do it unless your subject is staying still. Um, but you're gonna get a more uh, robust, um, a much richer sound if you use a boom mic properly um, than you will get from a lav mic. A lav mic's still great. Um, you do have the, the challenge with a lav mic of trying to hide it. And so, you know, in a situation like this, I'm not worried about hiding it because I'm presenting something, right? But if I was doing, if I was filming like an interview or a documentary and I and I have a smaller crew, well, the right choice is probably a lav mic. But I don't want the lav mic to be seen because it, uh, you know, it, it doesn't look good and it sort of distracts from the reality of what's being, of what's going on. It kind of, pulls you out of it and reminds you, oh yeah, this is a film I'm watching versus really letting you be in the moment and uh, wrap yourself up in the story. So we have to hide the mic. And when we do that, it's it's a challenge because we're hiding the mic usually behind clothes and there can be a rustle when people move around. Uh, we can hear that, that noise uh, of the mic rubbing against the clothes or against the skin. And that can be a real challenge too. And so uh, there are some great tools. I'm sure Pixel Connection sells some of these. I'm sure TJ could could probably link you to some of the stuff. But um, but there's uh, some some tools like like the Rode undercovers. Um, I think they're called. I think there's a thing covers you could you could look for um, that basically puts a little bit of, bit of a uh, sticky um, kind of a it, it puts something on either side of the mic that sticks to the clothes. Um, and takes away some of that rustle. So as people move around, you're not going to hear so much of that rustle. Um, there's other tools like the uh, Invisalov can be a great one, the little silicone piece. Uh, so there's some tools that help you hide lavs, and we use these a lot because it's so important, again, to not take people out of that story, but, but still to get great sounding audio. Um, oftentimes we're doing both, especially if we have a subject who's going to be sitting or standing in one place then we're also gonna put a boom on them. Now the important thing, or people, you know, shotgun mics, um, but the important thing is that we get that mic really close. I see a lot of people put these mics on their camera and they're, you know, five, 10 feet away. And the reality is that's not much better than the on-camera mic. It's a little bit better, but not much. It's still gonna be really hollow, echoey sounding. It's just not going to be good. So the only the place where that kind of mic is appropriate, the one that goes on the camera, is really for like vlogging and that kind of thing because you're going to be pretty close to to your camera if you're vlogging. So it works out in that kind of situation. Um, but otherwise, you need to use like a boom pole and get that mic really close to your subject. So what we do is we're aiming for like 12 to 18 inches away from the mouth. Uh, with our with our shotgun mics. And so what we'll do is we'll get everything framed up. We'll get our subject to sit in place. We'll get our camera framed the way that we want it. We'll move that boom pole, uh, that, that shotgun mic, into the frame. Uh, just kind of inch it into the frame. And the camera operator will call out. And we'll start to inch it up until it's not. And we want to get it just where it's barely uh, out of the frame. 
uh, if the camera's locked down. Now, if it's a handheld look, we might have to go a little bit further for safety, right? Um, but we wanna get that mic as close as possible. Um, and then we also wanna make sure that it's pointed directly at it because these are very directional mics. So, you know, if it's pointed this way, it's collecting the audio that's coming directly from that source and trying to cancel everything else out around it. So we need to have really good aim with it because if we have it really close, but it's pointed here, uh, it's not gonna be good sounding audio. So it's gotta be really pointed here. And we actually kind of aim for uh, the chest because it takes a little bit of the edge off of those, those P's and those T's and that kind of thing. So uh, we kind of aim for like right here. Um, you can also do it below. So if you're trying to give a little bit more headroom, um, you can do the mic below. Also can be a really great option for you as well. Um, so audio recorders are another big thing. Most of your cameras uh, are not gonna have like an XLR input. Um, you know, with the Lumix line, we actually use what's called an XLR1 and it's a little attachment. I'm using it right now on that camera actually, but it goes on to here and it gives us two XLR ports, kind of turns this whole thing into like a cinema rig, which is just amazing to have. So my lav mic is right now going into an XLR input in my other S1H um, that we're filming this with. Um, so that's a great option because everything's kind of synced up. Um, and so it doesn't, there's not as much work uh, whenever we go to edit these things, but that's not an option a lot of times. And so you need to have a field recorder. So there's a lot of different field recorders that you have. Again, TJ could give you some links to something that uh, Pixel Connection sells, but a uh, Zoom makes some really great products. Um, you know, everything from like a, a Zoom you get for like bucks up to like a Zoom F8, which is, you know, or F6, I think, which is around $600, $800, something like that. Um, as we go up, we do get significantly better quality audio because we're going to get better preamps as we kind of move up the line. I think it's the F6 that also has what's called 32-bit float, which is basically think like raw photo, but for audio. So it gives us way more flexibility. Um, we started using 32-bit float uh, recently, just in the last few months, and it's just a game changer. So, but it's quite a bit more expensive. So, uh, kind of weigh those pros and cons. Again, I could teach a whole other class about audio if you guys are interested in that. Um, okay, cool. Let's move on to shaky video. Um, so, <laughs> as you see, like in this little this little example here, video like this to me is just like unwatchable. Like, what's that movie? District is it? District? I can't watch that movie. I really wanted to watch it, but I couldn't because it messes with my equilibrium. Like my stomach can't handle that. I can't watch Blair Witch Project. Um, yeah. And it's just, in fact, even just seeing it in the periphery, I got to turn that off because it screws with my, with my brain. Um, but, uh, you know, a few tools that we can use, hopefully you already have a tripod, um, you know, and if your tripod has a ball head, just be aware that that's going to be like a lockdown shot. You're not going to be able to do pans and that kind of thing with the video and make it look good if you have a ball head. So if you need that kind of thing, pans and tilts, you really need to have a good fluid head on your tripod. Uh, monopods are a great tool. You want to have a monopod that has uh, three feet on it for video. Um, it really helps a ton. The, the kind that's for photo that just has like a solid stick in the ground that a lot of sports photographers and that kind of thing use, that's not really that good for video. Can down on three feet on the of it. Um, you know, some people use a shoulder rig. It's it's used left, less often these days. But if you're trying to get that sort of cinema handheld look with a you know mirrorless or DSLR camera, you know that's an option for you. Um, and you can get this for pretty cheap. You know, a couple hundred bucks, and you can mount your camera on a shoulder rig. It's not something we use at all, but it is an option. Uh, of course. You know, I'm sure Pixel Connection sells a lot of gimbals as well. Um, this is, you know, I'm not going to explain what a gimbal is. You probably know. <laughs> uh, and then track and slider. We use a lot of slider. Um, and what we have is is uh, a product that, you know, we can we can put it on and, and hit a button and it will automatically slide the camera left to right and also uh, pan it. And so we can get this cool parallax move where our subject stays in the middle of the frame but the background kind of moves around them. This is really awesome for interviews sort of thing. Um, also good for like hyperlapses and things like that. 
Um, and then and then handheld and handheld is sort of with an asterisk here, right? Because you know handheld became really popular in the early two thousands. Uh, you know, with like TV series like um, like Friday Night Lights. Uh, there's you know dozens of others that are escaping me right now. But the thing about the handheld look is they're shooting these with really big cameras. Um, and sort of the physics of this is if you're using a really big camera, it's naturally going to be more stable because of its weight. Um, but when you're using a smaller camera, it's naturally going to look shakier because of its weight. And so that's sort of the trade-off of having a mirrorless or DSLR camera that you're shooting video with is that it can be really shaky. And having image stabilization built into the camera body is just an amazing feature. Now, Lumix has done something really special with theirs. Uh, they're letting you use the stabilization of the lens and the body in tandem with each other. And it's otherworldly. I know that there's some other manufacturers who are doing stabilization, um, but in my opinion, it's, it's almost laughable compared to what Lumix has done with their image stabilization. It's just shockingly good. Um, we can even put a mode on called Lock IS where I can hold the camera like this with a big 200 millimeter lens and just hold it like this. And it genuinely looks like I'm shooting it on a tripod. Um, which otherwise it would be so shaky and jittery, you couldn't watch it if I was doing that without those, uh, without the image stabilization built in. So shoot handhelds a great look, but only have, you know that's great image stabilization because without it, you're going to be having a nightmare dealing with post processing and. Um, you know, before I had that, you know, shooting on like a 5D Mark II and a GH4 after that. And it was just not an option. Even our even our stuff that we shot with a monopod, we still had to uh, do uh, some post stabilization to that. So uh, just an amazing tool. If you're going to use handheld, really make sure that you're going to have a camera that can handle that. Otherwise, you're going to have a bunch of footage that you just can't use. Um, there's a little bit of a trick around that. Some people use like a camera strap and wrap it around and kind of push it out and that can help some uh, But you know, it's it's not ideal, but if that's what you got to work with then that's what you got to work with. So um, All right, we're gonna watch an example here. What is this one? This is an example of Something that we shot with the S1H that's completely handheld with the exception of one shot, we're actually just put the camera on the ground. But everything else you'll see here is shot completely handheld with no extra stabilization tools, just so you can kind of see how amazing it is to have image stabilization. So let's check this out. Uh, here we go. All right, I don't know how well you can see that with the live video thing, but again, uh, TJ will show you in a link later. If you go to filmmavericks.com, we actually have that one on our site as well. Um, but uh, let's next, let's talk about frame rates. Um, so this is, again, something for photographers that is just kind of completely foreign. Um, so there's two different things that we talk about when we talk about frame rates. One is timeline frame rates, and the other is like in-camera frame rates. So these are really different, and it's what allows us to um, to have some flexibility with our image and post in terms of like slow motion and that kind of thing. So in terms of our timeline frame rates, what I mean here is like this is the final deliverable, what we're actually going to watch, what you know, what our clients, what whoever watches the video, the viewers, what they're going to see. You're going to see time frame. 
most of cinema, we're seeing this in 24p. Um, anything you watch in a movie theater, it's you know most likely it's in 24p. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of I mean most of what you watch on Netflix, uh, 24p. Most of what you see, you know, if you're a wedding filmmaker, an event filmmaker, usually 24p. Um, in fact, I'm going to say like that's what you should do. It's you know in in 99.9% .9 of cases you should have a 24p timeline unless you're shooting for broadcast TV. I'm assuming most people that are watching this are not shooting for broadcast TV. Um, if you're shooting kind of typical broadcast TV news or something like that, it's usually done in 30p. And then sports is usually done in 60p. Um, so if you're shooting like kids soccer game or something, shoot it in 60p. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, so we're going to talk mostly about the 24p timeline. That's I shoot with. Um, so, if you shoot again for you're thinking, you're, you're playing ahead, right? That this timeline is going to be in 24p. So, if we want our video to play back in real time, then we're going to shoot also in 24p. So, if we're shooting somebody talking, um, or if we're just shooting something that we know we want to be played out in real time, we don't want it to be slow motion at all. We're going to shoot it in 24p. Um, and that's going to give us the best possible look. So um, there's other frame rates that are really great, even if we're going to have a 24p timeline, a 24p deliverable. We can shoot in 60p, um, and that gives us the flexibility of stretching that out to 40% speed and playing that out. So it's a really cool for slow motion. Um, you know, some of the cameras might have 120p um, to slow it down to 20%, or, you know, if you got like you can slow 240 frames a second and slow it down all the way to 10%. If you're using that, um, just realize that you know it's it's only for very specific uses that you would want to slow something down that much. It's kind of an extreme. Um, so you're, you know you're shooting maybe products like falling down or something like that. Just remember you're going to have to have a ton of light because you've got to slow your shutter down all the way to double your frame rate. So, you know, shooting it at, you know, if you're shooting 240p, you're going to be shooting at about 1 1 500th of a second, or potentially faster depending on the look you want to achieve. Um, yeah, so let's take a look at what things can look like. Again, we're thinking about frame rates. We're always at least doubling our frame rate. I'm going to show you an example where uh, Quentin Tarantino broke this rule um, here in Reservoir Dogs. This is the opening scene here. But all of my videos have looked like when you're watching it live, I don't know. Um, but basically, we're seeing this really weird stutter effect uh, that's played out as these guys are walking. And you know, if I saw anybody else do this, I would say, oh, that looks like crap. They don't know what they're doing. Uh, this is not a filmmaker who knows what they're doing. But because Tarantino is doing it, and we know Tarantino is, uh, you know, one of the one of the all-time greats, in my opinion, filmmakers. We know he's doing this on purpose. I would love to hear from him why he did this, um, but it certainly provided a unique unique look, um, and really set the tone for you know what turned out to be a really uh, crazy film. So, anyways, that's what it's going to look like if you go below um, the 180 rule. Uh, usually you know not a look that you want to go for so don't do that when you see the cars going by it looks really weird um, okay so let's talk about next mixing frame rates so this is something that we do all the time you know probably most of our work is mixing frame rates so we know we're going to shoot for a 24p timeline but the actual in camera that we're shooting uh frame rate that we're shooting in camera is going to change depending on what we're shooting as a part of this project. So here's an example of something we did for a trucking company where we're mixing frame rates. Sometimes we were shooting in 24, sometimes we were shooting in 60 and slowing it down. Uh, so here's what that looks like. Today, June 14, 2019, we dedicate the grand opening of our new Fouts Brothers facility to our founder, CJ Fouts.
All right, so again, there's times where, a lot of times in that uh, in that piece that we did for the, the trucking company, it makes sense to play the things back in real time because as they're moving some of these things around, it's already slow, you know, slow and methodical, the way they're lifting this, you know, the, the walls of this trailer up with a crane and moving it over. Like, that's already really slow. And this is something that's... A lot of times, it's sort of crush of slow motion. Um, you know, famous, famously done by, you know, people like uh, Peter McKinnon, who, you know, makes some really cool stuff. But I think in a lot of cases really overuses slow motion. Um, you know, things like people, people walking, um, people turning their head. It's like, do I really need to see somebody turning their head in slow motion? Well, maybe, uh, you know, maybe there's a time and a place for that. But uh, sometimes it can really make things kind of drag on and, you know, he does a good job of, of having some good pacing with some of his work so it doesn't feel like it drags on so much. But I see a lot of people that overuse slow motion and everything just kind of drags out. Uh, so it's really important that we use these tools intentionally and don't overuse them. Okay, next I'm gonna talk about speed ramping. This is just a very short clip of something that we did for a, a Division One basketball team. Uh, uh, in fact, I shot this at 180 frames a second. Um, and it gives the flexibility to really slow things down and then just speed up even faster than real time as well. So, uh, and uh, you're also gonna see some game time footage. The game time footage was stuff that we collected from the university. I just wanted to, want you to see it in a little bit broader context of the edit of this overall piece that we did for them. But the part that we shot is the more stylized uh, piece that you'll see at the beginning of this clip. So let's take a look. At guard, a junior from Wichita, Kansas, number five, Peyton Ricks. What's that one more time so you can kind of see, pay attention just to that early part of this, and you can see how we, uh, we changed the speed in one clip. At guard, a junior from Wichita, Kansas, number five, Peyton Ricks. Awesome. Very cool. Well, uh, this is the end of the formal part of the presentation. Uh, if you do want to reach out, you can reach out Jordan at filmmavericks.com, but certainly the Facebook group, uh, Film Mavericks Facebook group, that's the best place to reach me. Uh, TJ, do we have any questions? Yeah. So a couple, uh, one question that came in was, do you take in, it was during the exposure section and is there a certain amount of nits that you set like your skin tones to? So let's say you're doing a, you know, a talking head, you know, is there a certain place where skin tones, where you still retain color? Um, that That's kind of that question. Is there any like barometer for, you know, how, what that looks like? Or do you just go by kind of how it looks on the camera? How would you explain that? Yeah, good question. So um, typically skin tones are not the darkest thing in the frame. Uh, either, usually somewhere in the mid-tones. Um, and so we're not necessarily aiming for a specific place, a specific number um, on that waveform for our skin tones. We're more paying attention to the brightest and the darkest parts of the frame. So if we're getting those things to a, to a good spot, then we feel really good about it. Um, because our skin tones, again, regardless of, you know, somebody who's really pale or somebody who has really dark complexion, it doesn't really matter. They're still going to fall somewhere in the middle. They're probably not the darkest thing. They're probably not the brightest thing. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to be somewhere in the middle. And we're paying more attention to our highlights and shadows than we are to skin tone. Hopefully that answers the question. It does. And then I did want to real quick um, say hi to some people. Hello, Melva from Cleveland. Uh, Jen Stitt says hello. We love the Stitts. Hey, Jen. <laughs> 
Mark Toll from Portland, Oregon says hello. And then also um, Jen had a question. So they've been thinking about adding a little bit of video to their business. And the question is, if I had about $1,000 to spend on some basic items to add to my kit to do some proto promo video for my photography business, what would you recommend? And she said, assume my video, uh, my camera shoots good enough video. I can confirm her camera does video very, I mean, she her she's set with the camera and lenses. Awesome, okay, very good. Um, well, I'm assuming that probably most photographers are using strobes um, and not video lights, not continuous light. So that's certainly an area where you would want to think about investing some money. Um, there's some really great tools uh, that you know TJ could point you to. I'm not sure who all they. Um, you know, yeah, we have a lot in store. We have panels. We have you know stuff that you can use your existing soft boxes on, whether your Pro Photo Bowens mount. Uh, we have all that awesome. in store. Fantastic. Yeah. So, so definitely some lighting. You want to teach on light again, if that's something you are interested in, uh, let TJ know, and I'd be happy to teach a class on lighting for filmmakers. Something I taught at WPPI uh, in February. Um, but that's that's definitely a big one because, as you know, in fact, I know you, Jen. Um, for those who don't <laughs> know, we have a have a friendship, and I know Jen does some amazing work with lighting in her photos. Um, but it doesn't always translate the same for video and there's some different rules and that kind of thing that you have to, they're kind of at play when you're using video uh, continuous lights. So that's a big one. And then I think audio is the other biggest one really. Um, so, you know, uh, there's some, there's some great products and just, you know, a thousand bucks. It's hard to know, you know, probably you want to spend about half of that on lights and half of that on the, the audio. Um, but it kind of depends on what you're shooting again, like some things you can just use a live mic. Other things, boom. Um, so it's a good question. Uh, I'm not going to point to specific products, uh, without a little bit more research, but you know, feel free to reach out again and post on that group. Excellent. Well, that looks like that is all the questions that we have. So thank you so much uh, for joining us today, Jordan. I really appreciate you taking time. And then again, if you do have any questions or you want to know, you know, hey, what was that link that he shared or where can I find um, Jordan online? I'll be able to definitely answer uh, those questions for you. So I did want to go over just a couple things before we get off of here. Number one is Pixel Photo Fest is right around the corner, August 14th through 16th. So if you are looking for some of the best hands-on education uh, for photo and video, definitely take a look at Pixel Photo Fest. It's in downtown Cleveland. It's three days. We have a bunch of amazing speakers. And also, if you use code Lunch and Learn, you'll actually save 100 bucks, which is half off the entry to Pixel through to Photo Fest. So half off a hundred bucks, that's $30 a day. So again, I don't, I think you're going to be hard pressed to find a better educational opportunity for your business, for your hobby than Pixel Photo Fest. Also, I want to let you know that we have our weekly contest and this week the theme is my favorite lens. So this could either even be, uh, this could either be a picture of your favorite lens or you know, a creative one like this or a photo that was shot with your favorite lens. So all you have to do is follow us on Instagram, the dot pixel dot connection and tag us uh, hashtag the pixel connection and hashtag my lens. And then we will announce the winner on Friday. So it's a cool way to win 50 bucks. Also today, I believe is the last day for the 20% off sale on think tank and mind shift bags. So I've been looking at the, uh, picking up a new airport roller just because the size of my gear has gotten larger. So I need a little bit more space. So I've been looking at one of these bags myself, um, top quality really, I mean, think tank makes amazing stuff, uh, by photographers for photographers. So again, you could save that 20% off. I believe it's till tomorrow. Also, we are working with Sigma to raise money for local food banks. So 5% of your lens purchase goes directly to the Cleveland Food Bank. So if you've been thinking about picking up that new art lens, now's the time because, again, you can help families that are in need. If you're in need of additional help, so one-on-one -on, -one on whether it's a microphone, a camera question, anything like that, please reach out. We're actually setting up virtual one-on-one -on -one classes where we can sit down and answer any questions that you have. And this is for photo, video, lighting, whatever it is, we craft a class around your needs. So if there is something that you are in need help, uh, need help with, please let us know.
So what is going on for the rest of the week and into next week? So today I want to thank Jordan for helping us uh, with our awesome title, Your Video Sucks. Uh, tomorrow we're going to be working with Chris Fain from Profoto as he gives us tips on lighting. So if you're worried, if you're wondering, you know, how can I get my, you know, flash off camera? What do I need to do for soft light versus hard light? Or even if you don't know what those things mean, please join us tomorrow. One of the best techs in the industry, Chris Fain, is going to be here answering those questions for you. On Friday, we have the Friday Focus, which is where we share kind of the news from the week and also some inspiration going into the weekend. So we're going to cover, you know, what went on. So that new DJI drone that was launched, we're going to cover all the different news articles from this week, but then also some helpful tutorials. And I found some really good ones that I want to share with you guys. On Monday, we have Chris from Fuji to talk all about landscape. Now that the weather's starting to break, it's a great time to get out there and work on your landscape photos. So if you want to learn a little more about landscape and how, I mean, he's just an amazing photographer. Definitely join us for that one. On Tuesday, we actually have someone from Lumix back to talk about cinematography. So Kevin Best is going to be talking all about cinematography. So uh, something that's cool about Kevin is a, he's local, but B, he went to film school to, you know, to do this kind of thing. And he's worked on sets, both large and small. He's done docs. He's done, you know, a lot of different film things, and he's going to share kind of an intro to cinematography. And then finally on Wednesday, Tether Tools is going to join us and kind of explain why Tether. So I talked about a couple of Tether Tools items a couple weeks ago. They're actually going to be on to explain the why behind, you know, why you should tether your camera. So that's what we have going on. If you need absolutely anything from us, please let us know. We are open here at the store. Like I said, our normal business hours from 10 to 7 for curbside pickup. So feel free to give us a call, shoot us a message on social, anything that we can do to help you. We are here for you. So thank you again, Jordan, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Uh, we will definitely have you back in the future. And thank you everybody else for joining. Have a great day. Awesome. Thanks.